So first off, we're going to start with cryptocurrency. There's a bunch of logos of all the... There's, yeah. like there, there's a thousand probably by now. Yeah, um, probably. <laughs> between, yeah, cryptocurrencies and tokens. But we'll get into the token a little bit later exactly what those are. Um, and the thing is, most of those are scams. So don't, don't feel like, oh, I need to learn about all these logos. So... <laughs> Uh, so this is kind of a compar comparison of uh, forms of value storage and value transactions. So we have gold, uh, fiat, or dollars, and then uh, cryptocurrency. So you kind of see the different different traits uh, that each one kind of possess. And these are kind of the, the new ones that um, you couldn't really do before. So uh, that's what cryptocurrencies kind of uh, unlock. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, fiat in the way we see it as far as how the U.S. government issues currency and you know, really all of our currency is issued as debt and one thing that you kind of get down the rabbit hole of like well why does Bitcoin have value you end up having to really understand you know our own monetary system to see how it's different um, but that's kind of a whole another discussion but it's uh, maybe a worthwhile endeavor to kind of see how, well, how does our money work because um, then you can really see probably the, the value potential of Bitcoin versus uh, regular U.S. dollars or really any government currency. Okay, so here's some basic traits of cryptocurrencies. It's like it's like cash where it's irreversible. There's no calling up the support lines to hey, undo that transaction because that's the whole point of being able to be on a more of a trustless network is that you send it and it's done and you don't have to worry about chargebacks or anything like credit cards. So uh, merchants are they they they, they like uh, Bitcoin because they don't get potentially scammed by people doing chargebacks to their their accounts and losing. Uh, as well yeah um, and it's the yeah and it's like gold in the limited supply aspect everyone it's open source code everyone can see exactly that this is how many is going to be printed and everyone knows when someone tries to print more than they should um, so there's you know it's secured by math and there's really high guarantees on that and even you know like gold there are companies right now that go for that their stated goal is asteroid mining and like if you bring back one decent sized asteroid and you doubled the supply of gold and every other rare earth out there. So like cryptocurrency is actually potentially better than gold in terms of limited supply versus um, you know, something physical because it's still just atoms. You can get them from elsewhere. And with gold, we don't know how much gold is still on the ground because you know you discover a new plot of gold that's you know easy to reach. Um, you know it could potentially really lower the amount of uh, the cost of gold. So. Um, right now, for the most part, all cryptocurrencies are pseudonymous. They're not anonymous. Um, trying to get that last bit to be anonymous is actually very difficult because it's running up to the information problem. Um, so right now, um, it's, it's mostly all pseudonymous the best you can. You can yeah. so, um, so if they don't know what, what your Bitcoin address is, they don't know that your identity is associated with it, then they don't know who, whose that is. But if at any point in the future they figure out, oh, hey, you had those coins, they can then trace every transaction back from when you started to everything past that too. So there's you know some risk there, um, but it's like well if you don't do any, anything stupid with it, you really don't have anything to worry about it. Um, there are there are a couple of projects that are working on trying to be completely yeah, honest as well. Zcash but. and Monero are two privacy focused currencies, and there are some uh, innovations coming down the road with Bitcoin that will make it where you can be a little bit more anonymous. So. And, and this kind of goes back into the into the other slide with the uh, aspects of money. That one one aspect that makes money good money is fungibility, which is this aspect that your dollar is worth as much as my dollar, and it doesn't matter where they came from. The face value is actually face value. Yeah, um, and, and that's the problem when you don't have when you have a pseudonymity where you can track these transactions. Well, if they know that these transactions came from somewhere that you know an exchange or somewhere got hacked and these they know they're stolen but you might be the third person out and you don't know they're stolen, but someone else on the network does, then they might say, well, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna touch those coins because it might be possibly that you might have been part of that. And so there's you know, real risk to the currency without getting that anonymity. So it's not even just for privacy sake, but just for the you know, actual attributes of, as good money. I mean like you know, cash, you know, every dollar bill spends the same as every other dollar bill, yeah. you know, um, whether, because you don't know the history of it basically. But, with Bitcoin, the only way you can you can do this decentralized thing is that you have to know the history of all the coins, so you know that they've not spent twice. Uh, which you know, when you get into the more 
math heavy cryptography of the more privacy focused ones that handle that where you can do uh, special math that lets you let you know that it's not being spent twice but you don't know enough about it to know exactly where it came from um, we won't go into detail of that though yeah um, and then the other one here is whoever holds the private key holds all the funds um, so that's something that's a little bit different it's a property that you don't really think of with US dollars um, so like for US dollars um, you know you don't really hold be holding in cash you could say okay I have my I have my money right here uh, when you go to the bank it's like okay it's just a number on a screen now um, and Bitcoin's kind of a similar way in that if you have your money sitting on a, an exchange or where you bought it from where it's just a number on the screen you really don't have that money you just have a claim on someone that is holding your money and hopefully they're good for it and you can ask me about that because a few years ago I put some money on Mount Gox's exchange some bitcoins and they subsequently shut off withdrawals and went bankrupt and so I didn't get any of that money back and I didn't have control of my keys it wasn't my money um, it's through bankruptcy proceedings and I'm supposed to be getting some of it back but either way it just illustrates that you know if it's on exchange or coinbase holds it you know if they get hacked there's nothing they can do to, to solve your problem coinbase is I'd say a very reputable company that if they do get hacked, you're probably going to be made whole in some significant way because they got a lot of investors backing them. So unless they really screw up, you're you're probably going yeah, to be. I think they safe. have insurance on their deposits as well. Yeah. They're almost like a, a full bank, but yeah. they just focus more on the crypto than they do the US dollars. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like a private key is the thing that you can't really. There's no closest would be holding you know everything cash. in cash. Um, um, but the trick is, is knowing whether or not those funds have been spent. So this is a paper wallet. Um, this is where I kept a lot of my savings, all my savings for a long time on Bitcoin. Um, and this is actually encrypted. So what I did was I printed three of these off and I only knew the password. Um, so I gave one to my brother and one uh, to my parents. They threw it in their safe deposit box. And I have to trust them not to spend my money because they don't know the passphrase. Um, but they have this private key. So you can still print this off, and as long as you can keep your, your physical wealth secure, you can keep your digital wealth secure because you can generate these keys and do all this offline where it never touches a computer that's been on the internet or ever will be on the internet. Like, we, we did it and then destroyed the computer and it never touched the internet at any point. And so we have reasonably high assurances that there's no way anyone's getting, uh, no getting one, these private yeah, keys. Yeah, no one knew what our, our private key was. They could have yeah. snooped in the computer and stole the bit that yeah and, and as any more as you, when you encrypt it you don't have to trust your printer which you know printers are notoriously insecure because while it's encrypted all the printer knows is the encrypted private key so unless someone gets that and then breaks your breaks your uh, password then you're, you're pretty much safe um, but these are really slick though and you can do it where they're printed and they're not encrypted so if you're afraid of forgetting your password down the road or you know giving away as an inheritance or something they can they can always get it so all I'd have to do, and if I had my camera or my phone, I'd just be able to scan this and then decrypt it and bring it right into my wallet and then spend it. Um, and so if, if I gave you this piece of paper and it wasn't encrypted, you would then, you could have those coins. But it doesn't quite work the same where it's a, a complete bearer instrument like cash because, well, if I had another copy of this and before you could spend it, I went and spent it, well, you have a piece of paper that's already been spent. And so it's not quite the same principles as cash. Um, but you can make it quite cash-like, but it's even more secure because you can encrypt it. So you walk around with a bunch of money, and less uh, less someone knows what it is, you know. Or what's just a, a quick question, and I didn't read the article. I just saw it was a little headline that said some hacker stole seven million dollars in cryptocurrency. Yeah. What was the deal? Probably an exchange. That was, I think, that was the ICO that redirected. Oh yeah, there's an ICO. Yeah, that's the thing that, um, and and that's on the other side of this. You have the private key here, and so then, this is the public private key cryptography that basically allows all of these cryptocurrencies to work. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and, the, and the basics of that is that well, uh, you you can look at this private key and know that you can say okay, you know, verify that you actually have the private key for this public key. Well, you can just send a piece of information. And then if I have that private key, I can do some math on that and then send you back the results of that math. And they'll be able to validate on their side without trusting anything except for the answer and what they gave you to say, hey, they actually do have the key that corresponds with this, this public key. And so um, 
to receive money, you know, to load this thing, all I did was I had coins and then I put it paid to this uh, oh, public, public key, address. and then the private key is the only way you can unlock that. And what happened recently with that seven million dollars was that there was an ICO, which is a, a token launch, which we'll we'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, essentially, people were buying into this, and the thing was that the website that said, "Hey, here's the address you need to deposit to buy these tokens," uh, that website was hacked, and they just replaced the the public key. And so people were sending it to the wrong address, but they didn't know that. So um, that's you know that that's the first time we've seen a hack like that happen. And so it's still you still need. Which each, what basically had nothing to do with actually the crypto part of it being hacked. It was actually just a website. It, it's usually all the systems around the cryptocurrencies. Like Bitcoin's never really been hacked directly. It's always been exchanges or other people that have other other types of security flaws around it. Indirect attack, basically. Yeah, because exactly. you can't attack it directly because the laws of math just prevent it, basically. Yeah. Of... If they were to attack Bitcoin correctly, like, everything's gone. It wouldn't matter. They like, could, they could... You couldn't do credit card transactions online. Nothing would work in our sphere of... So basically, if, if that breaks, account. everything breaks. So, you know, yeah. you can only worry about so much at a time. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, so the next one. Uh, we didn't talk about why it's why yeah. value. Uh, holding a private key. So here's a couple different ones. There's like the paper wallet in the corner. They make these things that are called hardware wallets, um, which is uh, a little bit simpler than a paper wallet in some in some regards. Um, so yeah, private key is basically a password that is your money. So it's just a long string of letters and numbers that meet the protocol spec basically. Um, and if you ever can't reproduce that set of numbers by way of uh, you know, memorizing it or you know, having a piece of paper that has it, that is your money. That long string of numbers is basically a key that unlocks your funds. Yeah, and um, actually, I have some, I have some other cryptocurrencies. Um, like so, this this is my this is where I keep money right now on some of these things. Just a bunch of words. Um, so instead of even a long string of numbers, there's algorithms that'll take these words and turn that into your private key. So if you're if you're really trying to you know like get out of the country and not lose all your money, uh, all you have to do is remember. A bunch of words and if, if you remember those words you can walk butt naked across the border and then get to a computer somewhere and then bam you have all your funds yet. that'd be the brain wall there where you just memorize your key but that also means there's no physical backup of it your money is lost then so you can make sure your memory is pretty sound on that one um, yeah. but yeah we'll kind of walk through these other ones so yeah the private key is, is the is the secret we're trying to store safely because if anyone gets that they have all your money basically instantly and there's no, no way to get it back uh, paper wallet um, Harbor Wallet is actually a device, so you plug it in the computer and it actually has a cryptographically secure uh, chip, in chip inside of it that uh, basically is like a firewall of sorts from the online computer and your actual private And they all have displays on it, so even if, even if your computer is hacked, well it's going to send the request here, it's going to say, okay, do you want to send this amount to this address? And you're, you can trust this a lot easier because it's a lot simpler than your, your computer, there's a lot less layers of insecurity that I can break through. So it's a rolling code uh, that's on there, it's a rolling code? At no, no, this actually stores the <laughs> private keys. So the, there's, a, there's a couple standards that, uh, like I have a Trezor also, which I can actually just plug into my phone. And so that's how I have my, uh, a lot of my Bitcoins is I plug it in my phone, I can put in a pass key, and then I hit accept on my Trezor, it'll, sign, it'll send it from my phone to the Trezor, it'll sign it and then return the signed message and then broadcast that to the network and that's how you Get your transaction to go through. Um, it's a secure signing device, basically saying, yeah. "Hey, I check off. I have the private key. I can do the math here. I can prove it with the signature, and then it sends it and broadcasts yeah. in the network." And, and these have a pin on it, like this one. It's like three, three, I think tries, it's three, three tries, and it wipes it. It's a four. Um, it's a four, uh, four digit uh, numeric up, up pin. To, up to eight. Uh, you can do up to eight. Yeah. Yeah. It defaults four. And same with the Trezor. It's got a little bit different interface, but it's the same. Pin code and so basically, if, if you were to lose that or just give it to anyone and say, hey, or break in and steal my money, because uh, if you get through the pin code, you have full access to the, the funds, but if you only have three attempts to get a four-digit pin, if you don't know, you're basically not going to get in. Cause it's just... Yeah, and then, and then it will wipe it. So you still have the paper backup, which goes back to the kind of like the brain wallet. Like when you create one of these or a Trezor, um, which this is a ledger wallet, um, which it, these, these you can store a lot of different cryptocurrencies on there. Trezor only supports Bitcoin and Litecoin, I think, right now. I think so. Um, but uh, this one can do about six or eight currencies, I believe. Yeah, I know at least Zcash, Litecoin, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dash, Dash, Dash 
and uh, Stratus. Stratus. Stratus yeah, okay. that was on there. Um, but yeah, and, and so then these are backed up. You still have, a, a, but I you, think the ledger is like a 24 word seed, but it's still going to be on a piece of paper somewhere. But if you're really paranoid about that, well, you can still just use your own encryption and say, okay, I have these 24 words, use an encryption program, and then write the encrypted thing down, and as long as you remember your password, you can then get it back out. So there's there's lots of ways if you're really, really paranoid about this stuff, but you know, if you can if you can keep your money safe or anything else valuable safe, then you're you're probably okay with just storing it in plain text. And the way the ledger works, basically you have, you know, six or eight wallets on there or, or private keys, and they're all backed up by the same seed then. So if you if you were to lose your device, you could restore that device with a seed and you would have all of your funds for, for all of them back on there. So Yeah. Um, so yeah, paper wallet, hardware wallet, brain wallet. So hot wallet is basically you can download an app on your phone yeah, your... that holds a uh, that holds Bitcoin on it. Um, we call it hot wallet because it's internet connected device, uh, which means that it's always susceptible to being attacked. It's just like you don't keep too much money in your actual wallet because you could get mugged. Um, that's kind of the, the same thing. It's like, well, if your device is always connected, you can put pins and other security device security on that, but it's still you know, way more likely to get lost, stolen, or hacked into. So those are, those are simple, the most common ones, mycelium wallet. You have a send and a receive, and it gives you your um, account, what's your, what's your public address that people can send you money to. Yeah. It's, uh, it has it on there, and a QR code. So if they have a phone, they can scan your phone, and they can send it directly to you without typing anything in. Yeah. Um, yeah, they also do an NFC, too. So, like, I have a little NFC tag in here, and if someone has a wallet on there and yeah, associated like Bitcoin with one of their wallets, they could tap my wallet and it'd bring up their wallet. Because I should be able to. Yeah. I don't know why it's actually turned on. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. But yeah. And so it's it just, at that point, it's just giving out that, that private or that public key so that way people can know where to send it. Uh, I got a question. Yeah. What happens to the Bitcoin if you lose? It's stuck there forever. Just, it's if you lose there. the public or private key, it's. It just won't ever move. Because if you can recover it, someone could steal your phones in the same method, basically. So yeah. that's why it's it's so bad if you lose it, because yeah. if it were bad, anyone could somehow use it as an attack vector. Basically. Yeah. There's no forgot password. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there and, and another option is like the hosted wall. It's like Coinbase and there's, I don't know, uh, I think blockchain.info. There's quite a few different providers out there. Coinbase, I'd say, is probably the most well-insured and well-secured. Well um, so if you're going to put it somewhere, I'd put it there, but they are in the U.S. and uh, they yeah, just got like a bank, for so. like every, every record ever for all the Bitcoin transactions. So um, not, yeah, depends on how much you trust your government, depending on how much you want to put your money in there. But there are, there's also one other uh, one that's not on this list, uh, is like escrow wallets. Uh, I don't know of any ones active right now, but I'm sure they're out there, uh, where essentially every fund is a multi-signature uh, address. So you need two private keys to make a transaction, or usually it's three. So you would keep two of your keys, but you don't, you'd have one stored offline and then you have one on your phone, but then you have this third party that pretty much monitors your transaction and does like what credit cards do. It's like, hey, this is unusual spending. Are you sure you want to spend this? Uh, and so they'll, they'll be the other person you know, signing off on your transaction. Uh, but if they go offline or something, you'd still have your other key that you'd never get locked out of your own funds. So there's you know, one more, a little bit so more. Yeah, and that one would be kind of a combination of, of a hosted and you know having a you know your own. You'd hold your own private keys. You'd have yeah. to hold multiple private keys. So yeah, it's kind of a, yeah split between a hosted and then holding your own keys. Uh -huh. Is this regulated by the U.S.? Is there an agency there, that? Uh, kind of like in, you know, in what FDIC. way? I mean, it's it's regulated based on what, you know, under what axes is it? Um, like our regulatory regime, essentially, you have, you know, dozens of different regulators, and they all have this thing, like you know, SEC, make stupid people not lose too much money in the market. You know, that's their their, uh, op, you know, their operational goal. Uh, and so you also have like FinCEN, which is like uh, money, laundering. money laundering and stuff like that. And so there are some regulations, um, but as far as like individual personal use of it, not really, um, because it's it's just like anything else. The government taxes it as property. So yeah, you have it's a capital gains. It's capital gains. So yeah. they see it as it's not. They don't see it as, the IRS. 
they don't, they don't see it as, as currency, so you get taxed differently than currency is. And so every time you spend it, you'd have to calculate your capital gains on that, which is a real pain in the butt. Mm. But if you do it all through like Coinbase, they have a lot of stuff that pretty much solves all those problems for you as far as accounting. They do all the math for you and they give you what you owe basically and give that to your accountant. But if you do anything outside of Coinbase, it screws it all up because now you have to sync up multiple sources and make sure things yeah. right. So. And I think in the future it probably will change in terms of how they classify it, whether it will be um, capital gains or not. Uh, in, in the reason they did is because they, the way they saw it at the time is that most people are using this as an investment thing, not as a currency. Um, which I would have to say they're probably right on that to start yeah. with. But that, you know, if that's how they're reasoning about it, that also means they could reason later saying, hey, most people are using this as a currency now, we're not going to tax this capital gains in the future too. So. Yeah, and as privacy functions get in there, like, well, you know, at some point, you know, pay, you know, calculating the the capital gains on your, you know, coffee purchase and keeping track of that is is going to way outweigh the amount of money you'd even pay in taxes for it. That at some point, you know, enough privacy gets in there, it's going to be a lot harder for them to justify a much more burdensome tax regime on it. That they might just have to start treating it like currency because it's going to have the same properties of cash that. Well, they can't actually track where it's at all the time, so they're just going to expect you to report it as you'd expect to report cash transactions. 